Greetings. Welcome to Independent Bank Group fourth quarter 2019 earnings call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. A question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. If anyone should require operator assistance during the conference, please press star zero on your telephone keypad. Please note this conference is being recorded. I will now turn the conference over to your host, Paul Langdow, Vice President, Investor Relations. Thank you. You may begin. Good morning, everyone. I am Paul Langdale, Senior Vice President and Director of Corporate Development for Independent Bank Group, and I would like to welcome you to the Independent Bank Group fourth quarter 2019 earnings call. We appreciate you joining us. The related earnings press release and a slide presentation can be accessed on our website at IBTX.com. I would like to remind you that remarks made today may include forward-looking statements. Those statements are subject to risks and uncertainties that could cause actual and expected results to differ. We intend such statements to be covered by safe harbor provisions for forward-looking statements. Please see page 5 of the text in the release or page 2 of the slide presentation for our safe harbor statement. All comments made during today's call are subject to that statement. Please note that if we give guidance about future results, that guidance will only be a statement of management's beliefs at the time the statement is made, and we do not publicly update guidance. In this call, we will discuss a number of financial measures considered to be non-GAAP under the SEC's rules. Reconciliations of these financial measures to the most directly comparable GAAP financial measures are included in our release. I am joined this morning by David Brooks, our Chairman, CEO, and President, Dan Brooks, our Vice Chairman and Chief Risk Officer, and Michelle Hickox, Executive Vice President and CFO. At the end of their remarks, David will open the call to questions. With that, I will turn it over to David. Thank you, Paul. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. As always, I will touch on some highlights for the quarter. Michelle will then cover the operating results, and Dan is here to cover the loan portfolio. I will be back at the end with closing remarks and to open it up for questions. 2019 was another solid year of continued growth and financial performance for Independent Bank Group. We had a strong finish to the year with fourth quarter adjusted earnings per share of $1.32, adjusted return on average assets of 1.49%, and adjusted return on tangible equity of 18.32%. Throughout 2019, we executed on our strategy of disciplined, healthy growth. We organically grew our deposits by 10.4% for the year, which is reflective of our commitment to maintain a granular funding base and continue to minimize the pressure on our net interest margin. Organic loan growth was 4.8% for 2019, which was impacted by elevated payoffs in the fourth quarter as investors sold CRE assets to take advantage of low cap rates. Despite this headwind, the amount of total new loans funded in the fourth quarter was 11.7% higher than the linked quarter. This shows that across our footprint, our teams continue to source quality credits while maintaining the same conservative underwriting standards that we have that have served us well over these last three decades. I'll now turn the call over to Michelle for more details and operating results for the quarter. Thank you, David. Good morning, everyone. Please note that slide six of the presentation includes selected financial data for the quarter. Our fourth quarter adjusted net income was $56.8 million, or $1.32 per diluted share, compared with $34.1 million, or $1.12 per diluted share for the fourth quarter last year, and $57.8 million, or $1.35 per diluted share for the linked quarter. As you can see on slide eight, net interest income was $128.1 million in the fourth quarter, up from $87.1 million in the fourth quarter 2018 and up from $125.4 million in the linked quarter. The net interest margin was 3.81% for the fourth quarter compared to 3.84% for the linked quarter and 3.98% fourth quarter last year. The NIM, excluding all purchased loan accretion, decreased five basis points from 3.54% in the linked quarter to 3.49% primarily due to continued pressure on loan yields driven by competition and the continued depression of longer-term index rates. Total non-interest income was $18.3 million compared to $9.9 million in the fourth quarter of 2018 and $27.3 million in the linked quarter. Recall that we sold two loan pools in a branch in July that generated gains of $8.3 million in Q3 and in inflated non-interest income. The remaining decrease is primarily related to mortgage banking income with an offset for a gain of $1.3 million on the sale of our trust business. Total non-interest expense was $80.3 million for the fourth quarter, an increase of $3.4 million from the linked quarter. 
This increase is due to higher FDIC insurance of $3.1 million, $4.5 million in salaries and benefits, and $1.1 million in legal and professional fees. The increases were offset by a decrease in acquisition-related expense of $4.2 million and impairments of $1.2 million. Salaries and benefit expenses were elevated due to separation costs of an executive team member of $3 million and incentive compensation related to deposit growth of approximately $700,000. Legal expense for the Bank of Houston lawsuit we are defending accelerated to $1.2 million this quarter. We expect comparable costs in Q1 and that it will trend lower the remainder of 2020. In addition, we incurred consulting expenses related to a compliance project of $300,000 in the fourth quarter. That project should be completed first quarter with expected remaining costs of approximately $600,000. Slide 18 shows our deposit composition and cost. Total deposits were $11.9 billion as of December 31, 2019. Organic deposit growth was $213.5 million, or 7.2% annualized for the quarter, and $1.1 billion, or 10.4% year-over-year period. The average cost of interest-bearing deposits was 141 basis points, down 5 basis points from the fourth quarter of 2018, and down 15 basis points from the linked quarter. We continue to evaluate pricing on our deposit products and have lowered rates strategically. Market rates have flattened a bit since November, but we continue to get benefit from maturities of higher cost special products renewing at lower rates. That concludes my comments. I will now turn it over to Dan to discuss credit metrics and get some color on the loan portfolio. Thanks, Michelle. Good morning. Organic loan growth was $505.3 million, or 4.8% for the year ended December 31st, 2019. Overall, loans held for investment not including mortgage warehouse purchase loans, were $10.9 billion at December 31, 2019, compared to $7.7 billion at December 31, 2018. Slide 11 illustrates the annual loan growth comparisons. Slide 12 shows the composition of our loan portfolio and our commercial real estate portfolio. As of December 31, 2019, commercial real estate makes up 50.4% of loans which has declined from 51.0% in the linked quarter. CRE continues to be well diversified in the types of collateral with the largest segments in office and retail. Slide 13 further breaks down the retail CRE portfolio by property type. Mortgage warehouse purchase loans averaged $575.0 million for the quarter ended December 31st, 2019 compared to $434.1 million for the quarter ending September 30, 2019, representing an increase of approximately $140.8 million, or 32.4% for the quarter. This growth partly reflects seasonality and the impact of lower mortgage loan rates during the quarter, as well as our focus on growing this line of business this year. Asset quality metrics remain strong. Total non-performing assets were $31.5 million, or 0.21% of total assets, at December 31, 2019. This is a slight increase compared to the total non-performing assets of $18.4 million, or 0.12% of total assets, at September 30, 2019, which is primarily due to a $14.5 million commercial energy loan that has matured and is pending workout, offset by a partial write-down and subsequent sale of $1.5 million of ORO that was a former branch. Overall charge-offs remain low at 0.02% annualized for the fourth quarter, compared to 0.21% annualized in the linked quarter, and 0.01% annualized in the fourth quarter of 2018. Provision for loan loss expense was $1.6 million for the fourth quarter, a decrease of $3.6 million over the linked quarter due to continued strong asset quality, as well as more moderated loan growth. These are all the comments I had related to the loan portfolio this morning, so with that, I'll turn it back over to David. Thanks, Dan. Uh, We began 2019 by closing on the acquisition of Guaranteed Bank Corp. We had a successful integration and conversion and our Colorado market has proven to be every bit as strong in terms of growth and quality as our Texas markets. 
We ended 2019 by announcing a transformational merger of equals with Texas Capital Bank shares, and we've begun the hard work of planning for the integration of our two highly complementary franchises. We're excited for the opportunity this merger brings for our shareholders, customers, employees, and communities. Slides 20 and 21 will provide you an update on the progress that has been made to date, as well as some milestones for the deal as our teams continue to work toward a mid-year close. Meanwhile, we haven't taken our eye off the ball. Throughout 2019, we continue to organically grow our balance sheet without compromising on our commitment to credit quality. This disciplined execution of our strategy and focus on performance allowed us to enhance shareholder value last year through operating through reporting a strong ROA and ROE, disciplined share repurchases, and an increased dividend. As we begin 2020, we're focused on planning our merger of equals with Texas Capital while continuing to execute in our four great markets across Texas and Colorado. We're grateful to our customers, employees, and communities who made 2019 another great year for Independent Bank Group, and we look forward to carrying that momentum into 2020 as we embark on a new chapter uh, of our company's history. With that, we'll open the call to questions. Thank you. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star 2 if you would like to remove your question from the queue. And for participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star keys. Our first question is from Brad Millsaps with Piper Sandler. Please proceed. Hey, good morning. Hey, good morning, Brad. Hi, Brad. Uh, David, uh, it sounds like you had, you know, really good loan production in the quarter. Uh, however, you know, you got hit by some some big payoffs. Just curious if you could give us a little more color on sort of the dollar amount of the payoffs and, and how that makes you feel about, you know, sort of your loan growth prospects uh, for 2020. Yes, uh, Brad, thanks. Good question. We Our loan generation production was 10% up you know, for the quarter, for the fourth quarter versus the third quarter in terms of new loans we booked, but our payoffs were $120 million in excess of what they were in the uh, third quarter. So, you know, our, we put on uh, we put on $50 million more loans in the fourth quarter than we did in the third, but we had $120 million more payoffs, so a net of, you know, minus $70 million because of the excess payoffs. So all that to say uh, our loan officers are, you know, are hustling. They're doing a great job of building – customer relationships, expanding customer relationships, um, and we're encouraged. Uh, we've been around, uh, Dan and I have uh, been around to all the markets uh, already this this uh, quarter and speaking with people, not only talking about the merger, but talking about, you know, the need to continue to do, you know, strong business here in this interim period, and, and uh, our loan officers and our leadership across all of our markets are very positive, uh, optimistic about uh, where we are. Uh, you know, there's... Uh, a lot of those payoffs, Brad, were related to sale of assets. And I, I kind of, looking at how the payoffs picked up in the second half of the year, I don't have any, you know, data, but my my hunch is that, that uh, uh, when rates turned back down unexpectedly and that pushed cap rates back down on some of these uh, investor, you know, some of the investment real estate, uh, that, you know, owners, investors, some, you know, families decided that, gosh, you know, at these cap rates, we better think again about whether, you know, we want to sell some of these assets. And, and so uh, we saw a lot of asset sales. There was a little bit of, you know, refinance going on. Uh, a couple of the national banks, um, you know, deciding to add market share in attractive markets and doing so by competing with, you know, rates that we don't consider to be market rates and, uh, things like that, but but mostly it was just asset sales, Brad. Got it. You're so, still comfortable though with that mid single digit type type growth? Yes, I think five six percent as we've been talking to our folks here uh, the last uh, few weeks, just looking at the pipelines, looking at you know deals that we've uh, got uh, in under consideration and already approved, ready to close. Uh, we we think five six percent is still a really good number for this year. Okay, great. And then, Michelle, just to uh, follow up on the margin, um, obviously a couple moving parts. Um, you know, your, your accretion was just under $11 million this quarter. 
Um, also, you know, a bigger warehouse quarter for you guys, which can, can hurt the NIM a little bit, but accretive to dollars. Um, kind of curious with all those kind of moving parts, kind of how you're thinking about the core and reporting them uh, over the next couple of quarters. Um, yeah, I'm, st I'm still, my outlook, you know, from the normal accretion that's coming in, I'm still saying it's going to be about $7 million. Again, that differential comes from payoffs, and we can't always predict that. So, you know, obviously it could be higher than that again. Uh, but I don't expect that at this point. You know, we've, we've done a really good job of bringing down deposit rates. Um, you saw those came down significantly. <clears throat> so, um, but really since November, those have flattened a bit. We are still getting some benefit uh, from repricing of some of those specials that we put out there last year, and that's, you know, a significant reduction in cost on those. But I would tell you that our deposit costs, at least since November, have not trended down at the same rate that they did, you know, in October and November. Uh, loan pricing is competitive, but it, after looking at the January yields, those have not come down as significantly as they did in the fourth quarter. So, you know, kind of saying all that, I would call for, you know, a stable to maybe down a few basis points in them, you know, at least in the near term. Okay, great. I'll hop back into queue. Thank you, guys. Great. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Our next question is from Michael Young with SunTrust Robinson Humphrey. Please proceed. Hey, thanks. Good morning. Good morning, Michael. Um, wanted to just ask a quick follow-up on the pay downs. You kind of mentioned um, particularly some money center banks getting involved, but could you, you know, maybe just characterize it geographically if there's been any, you know, more concentrations of payoffs or pay downs in certain markets? I think the payoffs have been really across the entire footprint, Michael. Um, we've not seen it in a specific uh, state or uh, market that we serve. We have seen just from a high level um, this interest of, you know, some of the bigger companies expanding their, their market presence. They've been public about it, uh, wanting to increase their market share in these markets that are growing. And, you know, it's, it's something we've faced for, you know, 31, 32 years now that we, we happen to be in great markets and continue to increase our presence in great markets. And no surprise, that's where other people want to be. And so we're going to continue to see that, you know, and we think the, the demographic trends, the growth trends favor Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, Houston, San Antonio, and Denver. And you know, so we're going to continue to see that, no surprise. Okay. And maybe just switching over to expenses, um, Michelle, you, uh, there was, you know, a little bit of noise in the expense base this quarter um, related to some of the merger pieces and, and some other moving parts. But just on a, on a core basis going forward, should we expect the expense base maybe to be a little higher, you know, in preparation ahead of the Texas Capital deal if you guys are getting anything done on your side? Or should we really think of, you know, the expense base kind of, with normal growth uh, historically or tracking a 47% efficiency ratio or kind of whatever the bogey is we should use there? Yes, yeah, so if you look at Q4, sort of the, what I would call the adjusted expense base was around $70 million. And that included some additional expenses related to that, the lawsuit that we've been talking about this year. Those really accelerated. We know where we thought those expenses would be about half a million a quarter. They were 1.2 million this quarter. And based on what we know, they will be about that in Q1. Um, and then we also have a, that BSA project um, that we're using some consultants to help us with. It was about 300000 in the fourth quarter. It'll be about 600000 this quarter. So I think our expenses will be about the same in Q1. They could be up even just a bit from that, just from normal, you know, payroll, payroll tax expenses and those sort of things always come in higher in the first quarter. And then the $70 million uh, run rate is probably good for Q2. Okay, so more stable, not not expecting an inflation kind of off that number. No, I don't think so. All right, thanks. I'll step back. Thanks, Michael. Our next question is from Brady Galley with KBW. Please proceed. Yeah, thanks. Good morning, guys. Good morning, Brady. So it, back to the loan growth in the five six percent. You know, once TCBI is in the mix, do you think that that loan growth level will stay about the same, 
or, or will it will it change from that level? Well, I think for the regional banking franchise, which is kind of the terminology we're using for the legacy here independent franchise, the IBTX uh, regional banking model, I think it's going to – that we're safe there. And In fact, we intend to uh, expand – and, and add new teams, and we're going to be going to San Antonio, you know, via this merger, and so we're we're encouraged actually that we can, you know, hire teams and step up that growth, you know, in in post merger for the regional bank. The the other uh, the middle market and corporate and and some of the uh, business lines and and verticals at Texas Capital, we believe are very encouraged about their growth prospects as well. In terms of the overall corporation, Brady, you know, a lot of that's going to come down to what the what the final business mix is and and how we put together the go forward uh, business model, and um, so that will inform a little bit what that growth rate is. But you know, <clears throat> from a high level, we're going to be a growth company, Brady. That's one of the things as we one of the objectives as we're building out this go forward uh, business model is that we're in great markets. We should be able to grow. We are going to grow. You know, whether it's five, six percent, or eight, ten percent, or you know, what those numbers are, we'll be able to get more clarity once we have the, you know, once we can paint the roadmap to exactly where we're going over the next two years. Then I think we can give better, you know, guidance or not guidance. Uh, if the lawyers are listening, I didn't say guidance, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we'll be able to give. A clear picture of, of what we think about the growth prospects of the pro from a company once we get a little more you know clarity around exactly what that looks like. All right, that, that's helpful. And then, yeah, you know, David, I, I have your year-end 2020 tangible book value with TCBI at about 40 bucks. That puts your stock at you know 1.3 times tangible which uh, doesn't seem right for a company that's doing a, a high teens uh, return on tangible common equity. Uh, so my question is on the buyback. You know, your stock is is notably inexpensive. I know the buyback can be tough when you have a deal pending, but it, it, is there uh, the opportunity for you guys to buy back stock before the TCBI deal closes? And if not, you know, if the stock stays this cheap post-closing, do you think you'll uh, be active on the buyback front? Well, I will agree with you, Brady, that uh, we think the stock price is dislocated, but uh, I don't have a Ph.D. in whatever you have to have to figure that out, so I'm not going to uh, speculate on on uh, exactly why that is. We uh, we remain extremely confident in our model, extremely confident in you know, what we've told the market regarding this merger and what the performance of our company is going to be, you know, uh, in the short and midterm. Uh, that said, um, yes, we have a, uh, a policy, as you know, of, of taking excess capital and returning it to the shareholders via you know, dividends and, and a buyback program. And so, um, you know, that's a part of this whole equation, Brady, as we think about the go forward company. Um, you know, depending on you know what the pro forma size is of the of the company, uh, once we you know, close on the transaction, get everything adjusted the way we want it to over the next six to 18 months. Uh, I do expect that there's going to be uh, some significant cash flow coming off the combined organization that can be used for uh, stock buybacks. And to the extent that our balance sheet is slightly smaller, that would also free up capital. And, and as you allude to, you know, at these kinds of prices, uh, we've never seen, you know, our stock trade at these kinds of you know prospective multiples, and we'll be very aggressive in uh, in acquiring back our stock. And so, I, I don't think right now during the interim uh, period, Brady, while we've got you know our regulatory applications have all been filed, we're working with SEC on uh, on those regulatory filings, and and uh, you know I don't I think it would be disruptive if we tried to you know. Uh, do a lot of stock buybacks that would affect our pro forma capital ratios right now that we've put into the uh, into the models and into the applications. So I, I don't you know I don't expect we're going to be real aggressive between now and June, 
you know, buying back our our stock. But uh, you know, gosh, I mean, there are scenarios where you know we would have to take a look at that. But right now, I think the market will sort all this out. We're very confident in that. And look, what we what we can do, and we talk about this internally, Brady, is we can build the model. People are excited about the pro forma company, and we we can perform. And as we did in the fourth quarter, as we'll do in the first quarter, as we'll do in the second quarter, we're going to continue to perform. And as we execute and perform and show investors and our customers and our employees, you know, what everything is going to look like as a combined company, then I believe, you know, people will, will understand and see the value of the transaction. All right. And then, and then finally for me uh, is just a question on, uh, TCBI's credit quality. You know, IBTX has been a very uh, clean story, uh, you know, for years. You know, I think one of the concerns that investors have with the merger is just uh, the credit quality of Texas Capital. You know, we saw NPAs there uh, increase a decent amount when they reported earnings last week. So, can you just, you know, again, talk to us about how you got comfortable with uh, TCBI's credit and, you know, anything that you've any additional work or things that you've learned in the last, uh, you know, month or two post deal announcement? Uh, let me let me give a high level view of that, Brady, and then I'm gonna let Dan uh, speak to some specifics around you know the due diligence process. But uh, we, the numbers that you saw that were in the announcement were numbers. Those increases are you know September 30th to December 31st. We were doing our due diligence in November and early December uh, on that portfolio. So we, we have a really good handle on where they were and what they had marked and what they were experiencing, uh, you know, to the extent that we were, you know, seeing that information as part of the diligence. So we were not surprised, I guess. So I'm start with that. We were not surprised that, um, you know, there was a tick up in, in some of those categories. Uh, but we we feel like you know, we've got a good handle on what that you know exposure is and where it's going and and uh, I'll let Dan give some you know color commentary on that. But yeah, not a lot to add to that, David. Uh, I would say the the uh, due diligence process that we went through certainly um, uh, confirmed that they are you know working hard to. Uh, assess their portfolio constantly, that they uh, understand what their risks are and are appropriately uh, uh, grading those. And so I don't think, as David said, I don't think there was any surprise in that, and I think they're managing that accordingly. Yeah, and they're, you know, they're going to continue to manage. Uh, uh, we have a lot of confidence in their leadership there. They're going to continue to manage you know, their credit appropriately between now and the merger, and we believe we've got a handle at a high level on what the you know, overall exposure and risk of both our portfolio and their portfolio is. And we are very confident in looking at, you know, CISA reserves and looking at the mark on the portfolios uh, going forward that, you know, at the merger, there will be plenty of uh, reserve there or will be an appropriate reserve there for the amount of risk in the combined portfolio. All right. Got it. Thanks for the call, guys. Okay. Thanks, Greg. Our next question is from Michael Rose with Raymond James. Please proceed. Hey, good morning. Um, just wanted to touch on deposits. Uh, Michelle, I think you mentioned that uh, deposit costs have been, you know, relatively flat here, but you have some CDs that are kind of coming due. Can you remind us uh, the amount uh, that is coming due over the next couple quarters and, and maybe what the uh, what the cost is? Thanks. I don't have the exact number of those dollars, Michael, but if you remember, you know, we had some specials that we went out last year, you know, first quarter that were paying 265 to 270 and if those renew, our current rate on those is like 150 so it's a significant drop in cost um, relative to where they are. And, and we are still strategically looking at, uh, you know, some of our money market index funds and you know, trying to strategically lower some of those costs where we are. It's just market with the Fed not lowering rates um, or the outlook is that they're not going to lower rates. You know, some of our competitors um, have put some more significant rates out there again. Um, not across the board, but in certain markets, you know, we have gotten some feedback that, you know, people have been trying to gather deposits. 
So it's just been a little more challenging lowering the rates at the same significance that we were able to in October and November. But I still expect that our cost of funds is going to come down a bit this quarter. Okay, that's helpful. Maybe as a follow-up, uh, TCBI rolled out a new online deposit platform, you know, last week. Are you guys going to participate in that before the deal closes? Is there any plans to do that, or is it just going to happen naturally once the once the acquisition closes? Yeah, correct, uh, Michael. We're uh, they uh, rolled out their Bass Bank uh, project. We're uh, that we, there's no crossover, no ability for us uh, uh, to participate in that. You know, in this interim period, and then. Uh, uh, you know, we're we're excited about having a digital platform for account opening and and really uh, all the possibilities of that uh, across small business and account opening uh, and and how that plays with our branch uh, banks you know our branch network is are part of what we're in discussions now uh, talking about how we can utilize that across our 94 branches that we're bringing uh, to the merger. And you know, but I, I think the, the technology is is good and and something that will be valuable to us in, in the days ahead. Okay, maybe uh, one final one for me. Can you just give a little bit more color on the energy credit? And you know, I know it's a small piece of the portfolio at this point, but is um, you know, you have the level of like what the classified and criticized are in that book, and would you expect any more issues? Um, you know, over the next couple quarters. Thanks. Yeah, Michael, this uh, credit has been a long-time classified credit. It was part of the credits books uh, some five, six years ago, and uh, it's been effectively in a longer-term workout situation for a couple of years now, so no surprise on that. Um, actually continuing to collect payments on it, but the note was matured at the end of the quarter. We chose to leave it that way as the borrower continues to uh, uh, pursue a uh, sale to assets, which is currently what they're doing, uh, or potential MES refi, um, either of which would take care of the debt, but uh, no surprise in that. So there's no migration in that credit in that sense, other than it was just over 90 days at the end of the quarter. Um, as it relates to the rest of the portfolio, it continues to be really good. As we spoke to before, the group out of Fort Worth, the energy team that we hired in over a year ago, had a really nice year in 2019. We really were able to cherry pick some of the best energy credits uh, out there, and uh, we sure like the way those look, uh, even in today's uh, environment. So, uh, uh, no continued uh, deterioration or migration expected in the portfolio. All right. Thanks for uh, taking my questions. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Michael. <clears throat> Our next question is from Matt Onley with Stevens. Please proceed. Hey, thanks. Good morning, guys. Good morning, Matt. Uh, I want to go back to the discussion around the stock buyback and thinking more longer term. David, what do you view as the, the minimum capital threshold for a bank that's closing in on, on $50 billion of assets? And, and specifically, which capital ratio uh, would the bank be most focused on over the next few years? Thanks. Um, I, I think we'll continue to look, uh, Brady, at the you know, tangible equity capital uh, from just a, a base level and then on a risk-adjusted, you know, total capital risk-adjusted as the other kind of lever that we look at uh, most of the time. And, uh, you know, I hate to, to put a floor or anything on it uh, at this point, Matt. A lot of that just depends on what the business model looks like, you know, and what we perceive the risk to be and the volatility. You know, our objective is to put together a, you know, a high-performing, you know, strong efficiency ratio, strong return on tangible equity company that's growing, but growing, you know, with strong risk parameters as we have it, you know, independent over the years. So that's the go-forward model. And, and what that capital ratio looks like, uh, will, will determine, but, you know, eight and a half percent is what we've been saying on a tangible equity here the last, you know, last, uh, year or two is kind of what we feel comfortable with, uh, as a target long term and, you know, eleven and a half, twelve percent on the total risk base. And so I don't see anything at this point that would change my mind about those numbers. 
Um, but I reserve the I, I, I strongly reserve the right to uh, to change that up or down, you know, depending on you know, what the pro forma business model uh, is fleshed out finally to be. Uh, but we will be, to your point, though, let me let me just reemphasize this. To your point, we're going to be we intend to continue that dividend, uh, even though I know TCI has not historically paid a dividend. We're going to continue that dividend. Our board will always be looking and be inclined to try to increase that dividend over time based upon the earnings of the company, and then uh, and to be you know, aggressive. And so, in case I wasn't clear, you know, my previous answer. We will be very aggressive within, you know, the constraints of capital and earnings uh, on buying back our stock, especially when it's trading at these kind of prices. Okay, understood. And then, David, you, you've mentioned a few times you're putting together the go-forward business model, and you're going to come to the market with that at some point. Is there a timeline of expectations you want to provide today as far as uh, when, when the investment community will hear more about this go-forward plan? No, I think we've said, uh, Matt, we'll do it absolutely as quickly as we can. We're working hard on it. Um, you know, our, uh, as you might imagine, our employees, uh, both companies are anxious to know, you know, what that model looks like and how it affects, you know, everyone. Um, and then uh, obviously investors as well. Uh, and so as, as absolutely quickly as we can, just too early to say what, you know, any specific uh, timelines on that. Um, so we're, we're working on it, and we will be very communicative as quickly as we can be. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Matt. As a reminder, star run on your telephone keypad if you would like to ask a question. Our next question is from Raul Patil with Evercore ISI. Please proceed. All right. Thanks. Um, so your, your NIM was around 381, uh, you know, Texas Capital's NIM. 295 this quarter. So just using sort of a weighted average to get a you know combined name of you know 320. Um, going from there, you know you started you stated you know your name will be down you know stable to down few bits. Texas Capitals 2020 name outlook of 305 315 implies some improvement from the fourth quarter level. So you have that dynamic going on. And then you know post the deal close, uh, you will eliminate the accretion that's tied to guaranteed Bancorp, but you will have Additional accretion from you know the 195 million related to non-PCD and the 37 million loan rate mark, and let's assume you know that's accreted over five years, so that's around 11, 12 million of quarterly accretion. That's 10 bits of you know per quarter accretion. So I'm just trying to get a sense for the first full quarter post the deal close. Is it fair to think about the NIM starting point of around 325? Is that a fair assessment? I think it's way too early, uh, honestly, for us to uh, to be able to give uh, an indication on that. Uh, a lot of that depends, of course. Uh, part of what's uh, what I believe uh, Texas Capital pointed to in the fourth quarter was, you know, the the, the size and the growth in that mortgage business, which you know uh, was partly to you know push down the uh, the NIM, and uh, you know, and again, all these things as we look forward. You know what the relative size of that mortgage uh, business, which Texas Capital, I believe, has indicated. You know they expect just a normal uh, attrition of that down to a more normal level, and and a lot of it depends on what that normal level is, and and then what other businesses you know we choose to focus on, and which ones we de-emphasize. Uh, and so I I just don't I don't think we could give any clear color, and I wouldn't feel comfortable, Michelle. You know I don't know if you yeah I mean. I think the I think the way you're thinking about it, all the parts that make it up, that does make sense. But there's you know there's too many unknowns at this point to give a prediction on what what the NIM would be at that point. Um, I didn't hear you know there is a there's a credit adjustment in Cecil that will come back into income, but we do expect that there will also be a rate mark that will come back into income that will replace our current rate mark. And I didn't hear you say that, so that might be something else you need to think about. Okay. Um, and then just on the expense basis, so uh, the fourth quarter expense came in a little higher than what we were expecting, and even what you had tied it to. Uh, so just analyzing that $70 million, you know, get to a 280 number, uh, the deal closes, you know, mid-year. So you have 50% of Texas Capital's annual base of, you know, around, let's say, 
50% of that is like 320-ish numbers. So you, you're starting from a 600-ish level for the full year, $50 million you know, of cost saves realized in the second half of this year. So is it is it reasonable to think about the full year 20 expense base you know, of around $550 million? Um, you know, I don't, I can't really answer that right now either. I think the, I think the projection, the model included, you know, 25 million of cost saves this year for the second half of the year. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. And we do have one final follow-up question from Michael Young with SunTrust. Please proceed. Hey, I just wanted to ask maybe one big picture question um, on just the overall, you know, kind of pro forma company. You were, you know, pretty explicit in the pro forma EPS accretion and tangible book value accretion, um, as well as the balance sheet size. But then you've kind of talked about some some fluctuations in some of the business lines, et cetera. So, is there anything that you, you know, could give that would provide a little more confidence in, in some of those initial projections? Or, you know, should we think about some volatility in both the businesses and really just stay focused on the profitability level of the pro forma company? Just trying to gauge that. Uh, great question, Michael. We, uh, the tangible book value accretion is a, a mathematical certainty. You know, when we close and we do the stock exchange, that will create that uh, tangible book value that we've talked about. So, I think you start there and, you know, so if there's concern about whether that's going to materialize or not, I'm not really sure I understand that. Uh, in terms of how we get the earnings accretion, you know, partially related to the cost saves, which, again, we have a great deal of confidence in being able to achieve those, what we've announced. And then, uh, you know, and then the business models we've been talking about this morning go forward. And I think that's really what, what you're talking about, uh, Michael, is, you know, at what point can we give some confidence in around, you know, what the earnings and the growth and the margins are going to be on this go forward, you know, merged balance sheet. And I will tell you, I am, am extremely pleased when we look at the go forward leadership team has been hard at work now for, you know, five weeks, uh, you know, uh, meeting and talking, and everyone is focused about, and I've been very impressed that the leadership of the two teams, starting at the board level to the executive level, and then, you know, down from there, the teams we put together in this integration management office are are all focused almost exclusively on this go-forward entity. And to be able to rally two pretty different companies in terms of business model to come together so quickly focused on what are all the great things we can accomplish by putting these two together and the go forward model, I think it's going to turn out to be pretty unique when we look back at this over time. So um, that's the confidence that you're hearing us express in, you know, we, we feel really good about where we are. It's early and there's some work to do and a lot of tough decisions to make. But, you know, as we've said all along, we're willing to make, the hard decisions. There are no, you know, sacred uh, cows, if you will. I hate to always pick on cows, but there are no, you know, there are no uh, assumptions from our previous business model other than we're going to keep serving the customers of Texas and Colorado in five of the seven to ten best markets in the country, and we're going to do it in a way that's that's uh, you know, safe and sound. Uh, you, you mentioned the volatility. That's one of the objectives in the go-for business model we talked about, which is to bring down the volatility of, of earnings and NIM and all of that into a, you know, into a stable. And, and that's one of the real positives of this because, as we've talked about it, it the mortgage uh, business on the TCGI side, the commercial real estate on on the independent bank side, all that merges together into a much, you know, better looking combined balance sheet. And uh, so we, we continue to be very encouraged. Uh, and that really goes back to the, the very earlier question of when can we, you know, paint that picture of exactly what this is going to look like just absolutely as soon as, as the lawyers will let me tell you. And 
I guess as a follow up, is is there any you know expectation on on timing of when the lawyers might uh, lift that <laughs> that ban, and, and, and should we expect that in, in kind of a quarterly earnings <laughs> conference call scenario, or or would that be a you know a separate event? Any just any color on that? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I mean, clearly by the April you know. Uh, April first quarter earnings call by the end of April. That's you know another three months from now. We should begin to be able to have more color around that uh, by then. Whether we would do a separate call or separate filing or anything between now and then, I you know I don't know. I know we're going to be uh, we and uh, the Texas Capital leadership are going to be out and and about. ability to do it. Okay, David. Thank you for all that color. I appreciate it. Thanks, Mike. We have reached the end of our question and answer session. I would like to turn the call back over to David for closing remarks. Thank you very much. I uh, really appreciate everyone being on this morning. It's an exciting time for us, and, and I appreciate your patience, uh, and I look forward to seeing uh, the investors and analysts uh, on our travels here this spring. Um, Thanks for your interest in the uh, in independent bank and in our uh, proposed combination with another great company in Texas Capital. So have a great day. Thanks. Thank you. This concludes today's conference. You may disconnect your lines at this time, and thank you for your participation.